2 Corinthians chapter number 9. And we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. Tonight is the final uh, message of our series on Christian finances. And tonight is in a very, very important one. Of course, all of them are important, but I really believe that the very first one and now this last one are the most important of all of them. The first one was a message on and a reminder of stewardship. And that really, the reason that it was the first one is it lays a foundation for all of the rest of them. To understand in our finances that if we are going to have a, a, a balanced Christian life in the area of finances, then we have to begin with the fact that all money belongs to God. Whether it's in your account or my account or Jeff Bezos' account or uh, George Soros' account or uh, whomever it might be, it doesn't matter, Warren Buffett or you name somebody that you know of that has a lot of money, it doesn't matter whether we have a lot or a little, anyone and everyone is just handling the money that it really belongs to God. And that is especially true for you and me as Christians. Our money is God's money. And so we need to look at it with stewardship in mind, that we are stewards of God's money. And of course, we talked about several other things. We did talk about uh, being frugal with our money and remembering that because it's God's, we shouldn't wastefully spend it. And then, of course, we talked as well about saving and how important that is and a budget and things like that. I hope that those were an encouragement and helped you. But now tonight, we want to look at, again, what I believe is the, the other very important part, and that is giving. You know that we can have all the others right and we can be good, frugal spenders. We can be savers. We can be wise and have a budget and be very organized with our money and we can plan for the future and have a retirement that's set up to where uh, uh, if, the, uh, if uh, we're not able to work anymore, then uh, we have something to live on and those are all good and fine. But if we are not givers, then I would say again that we've really failed in the area of money. And I believe that God would uh, call us into account over that if we are not givers. And so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verses 6 and 7, which is our text verse. And the Bible says there, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver." This is in the context of giving to the Lord's work. The apostle was writing to the Corinthian churches, reminding them of their uh, commitment that they had made to give to the work of the Lord that Paul was doing. And he was reminding them that uh, they are to give with a cheerful heart, a cheerful attitude. And God loves a cheerful giver. And I want to encourage you with that tonight, that God wants you to give with a cheerful heart. But with that said, he also reminds us in verse 6 that when we are giving, we are sowing. We are like a farmer who is planting seeds in the field. And if we plant only a few seeds, if we sow sparingly, well, then we shouldn't be surprised if only a few stalks of grain come up. We're going to reap sparingly. But if we sow bountifully, we give out a lot of seed, then we shouldn't be surprised and we won't be surprised when much harvest is able to be uh, gleaned because we were sowing bountifully. And I want to encourage you that when you're giving, giving to the Lord's work, giving to anything that God lays on your heart that is biblical and right and that, that uh, God would have you to do, that you are sowing seed and someday you will be able to reap the benefits or glean that harvest. As you see there in your notes, the final building block of the Christian financial life is generosity in giving. Let's pray and we'll get right into the study. Father, thank you so much for the wonderful day we've had already, the good time in Sunday school, the wonderful morning service, and now, Lord, the preliminary part of this service that we have just thoroughly enjoyed, the music and the fellowship. But now, Lord, as we look into your word and we learn about giving, would you enable me to preach and teach in such a way that we all are helped as a church in this area of giving? Lord, I do believe that we would be amiss not to remember that you want us to be good with our finances so that we can be a blessing to others. 
and so that we can bring honor and glory to your name, not just so that we become rich. And so, Lord, I pray that you would use this message to help us with that. Lord, I need that reminder. Please help and give that reminder to each one of us. And Lord, if we are weak in the area of giving, would you convict us and strengthen us in that area? In Jesus' name, amen. As you open your notes there, I want you to see in the kind of introduction that Jesus set the example for us in giving, as he does in all things, doesn't he? He sets the example. But you remember 2 Corinthians 8, 9, where the apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. What a great example the Lord Jesus Christ is. And what a very high bar he set for us, didn't he? That he became poor so that we could be rich. I don't know of any of us that have given to that extent yet. But Jesus set the bar very high. Paul continued to set the bar high in regard to giving. He writes to that same Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. He was ready to give his very self for the church at Corinth. He was ready to give whatever and to be spent so that the church at Corinth could flourish. Again, he set the bar very high. And then the Macedonian Christians continued the pattern in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and used the Macedonian Christians as an example. He says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, which means we want you to know, of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The Macedonian Christians continued the pattern. They gave even beyond what would have seemed normal by the grace of God. And now, as I put there in your notes, now it's our turn. Jesus set the bar. Paul the Apostle followed in his footsteps. The Macedonians gave us a good example. And now it's your turn and my turn. Are your finances in order yet? Are they all set up? Have you got that budget going? Are you saving? Are you out of debt yet? Are you working on setting some money aside for the future? I realize you may be just in the beginning of all of those things, or maybe you feel like you're overwhelmed in all of those things. Well, I want to encourage you that the goal of all of that is that you might be a good giver. By the way, not just to Madison Baptist Church. I just mean a giver to God and His work. All right? So let's take these things, three um, areas of focus at a time, all right? Number one, I want you to see that we ought to give because we want to be rich toward salvation. We want to be rich toward salvation. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not talking about giving and you'll earn salvation, all right? We haven't started indulgences yet, all right? Not in my time. We're not going to have those. However, we ought to give because we want to be rich toward salvation. I'll show you what I mean by that. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. You cannot earn salvation by good works. That hopefully is self-evident to you and to me in uh, having known the Bible and preached the Bible for a long time. But Luke 18, verse 18, will help us to see something important. The Word of God says there, And a certain ruler asked him, asked Jesus, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he wanted to do something to get heaven. Verse 19, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? 
For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Let's review that story quickly there. Letter A in your notes, the story. Roman numeral 1, underneath letter A, this religious man had much pride in his completion of the law. And I should have probably put that in quotes because you and I understand he really wasn't completing the law. But he sure thought he was. And he had much pride in his completion of the law. All these have I kept from my youth up. Boy, he must have had some childhood, huh? I wonder if we would ask his siblings or his parents if they would agree. But he sure thought he had done a good job. Roman numeral two, there was one thing lacking or one lacking component that showed his distance from God's standard. Listen, that's what Jesus was getting to. Jesus was not saying you can earn salvation by selling all that you have and giving it to the poor and coming and following me. That is not what Jesus was saying because that would contradict the rest of Scripture. What Jesus was saying there is there was one thing that showed that he was very far, actually, from completing the law. Romans says this, that we are all uh, destitute of the glory of God. I'm not using the right English words. I'm thinking of the Spanish words. By the way, we were able to lead another uh, man in the Spanish service this afternoon to the Lord. He raised his hand in the invitation and took him out, and that's why that verse is on my, uh, on my uh, heart, right? Estamos destituidos de la gloria de Dios. We're destitute of God's glory. We're far from it, right? We've come short of the glory of God, the King James Bible says. So listen, we are far from it. Well, this one thing, this one lacking component was what was showing that this man also had come short of the glory of God. And that lacking component was that he was not willing to give to the needs of others, which really would have fulfilled all the law, wouldn't it? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your fellow man or your neighbor as yourself, that completes all the law. But we don't do that. This man was, his, was shown that by his unwillingness to part with his riches. Roman numeral three, those riches, therefore, were an impediment to his salvation. Now, they did not keep him from salvation. But they were a stumbling block, probably would have been a better word for me to put in there. Roman numeral four, only a miracle from God could bring him to salvation. That's what Jesus said. With men, these things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So what's the lesson for you and me? Why is it important for me to give because I want to be rich towards salvation? Well, the way that we handle money reveals our relationship with God. Okay? Please understand Faith in Christ saves. Amen? Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, whosoever believeth and confesses with his mouth has salvation. We know that from the book of Romans. It's crystal clear. However, our giving attitude reveals what's really in our heart. You see, because it's easy for me to be like this rich man here and on the outside fulfill all these laws that everyone can see on the outside but what you can't see is the heart. But there's something that I have in my back pocket that is connected to my heart, and it looks like this. And men, most of you probably have one of these. Ladies, you have something similar probably in a purse. It's a wallet. And the wallet has strings that are connected to my heart. And whatever the heart does, this wallet will do. Whatever's going on in the heart is revealed in this wallet. And so that's why it is important for me to give because I want to be rich towards salvation. Luke 16, 13 says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So whatever my relationship is with money reveals the, the truth in my heart. Now, number two, under letter B, we must be careful, or you... We must be careful that your money, I didn't write that properly, I apologize for that. We must be careful that our money does not become an impediment to our own salvation or that of our children. I want you to think what I, what I wrote there, and you judge it against Scripture and tell, and tell me later, okay, not now, but if I'm correct. And I want you to, I'm going to state it again, listen. We must be careful that our money does not become an impediment to our own salvation or that of our children. Now, I trust that you are saved, but I can't see your heart. 
But I would encourage you to, as the Word of God says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And to really look and see with fear and trembling that you are in the faith. And you might say, well, pastor, how can I know? Well, only the Spirit of God can reveal it to you. But I can tell you one place you ought to look is your finances. If you have a hard time giving up money, if it is a God to you, if it is something that you want in an, un, I don't want to say unnatural way, but in an, in a, a, an imbalanced way, if that is a desire that you have that's deep down in your heart and you just want to make all the money you possibly can, and when there's a need or when there's a call to give to somebody who's in need, it just is a pain for you to even open up that clenched fist and give some of that money, then I would say you might want to just check and make sure you're saved. Again, I'm not your judge, nor is anyone else here, but God is. But that's a good indicator, a little bit of a barometer of where we are. But I think even more important than that is we don't want our riches to become an impediment in our children's salvation. You realize that how you handle money, you can be born again on your way to heaven, looking forward to the kingdom of God and ready for it. But if you don't handle your money correctly, you can impede the work that God wants to do on your children and their salvation. Because what Jesus said here is, listen, it is difficult, using my words now, for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. How hardly shall a rich man enter into the kingdom? So if I don't lay things out right for my kids, I may be making it very hard for them to come into the kingdom, depending on how I do. Well, one of the ways that I can help them to have a softened heart and to see that money is not really that, uh, that important is for them to see me go through life with an open hand. Even if God has given me great riches, if my children see me give and be generous, what is that subconsciously teaching them? Money is not really that important. Money is here to serve others, not to serve us. God gave us this because he wants us to love other people, right? I'm, I'm helping them to understand money is not important, but sometimes... And by the way, this can happen to those of us who are not rich. We could live in a household where we are scrimping and saving and living paycheck to paycheck, rubbing every two pair of pennies together. We can be so stingy sometimes that we make a God out of money and our children subconsciously get this thinking of money is important. Money is the most important thing. And money is what I want to seek after. And if, we're, if we've taught them that, we have failed in our finances, haven't we? We want them to understand that's not it. So give because we want to be rich towards salvation. Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty three, 23, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. I shared that with the Sunday school class this morning. That is a great verse, very important. There is no in-between. We are either 100% for the Lord or we're against him. And that goes in money as well. Number two, here's another reason why we should give. We should give because we want to be rich toward God. Not just salvation, but rich toward God. Luke 12, let's turn over there quickly. Luke 12, and we want to look at verse 13. Luke 12 and verse 13. By the way, can I say this too? And, and please follow with me on this. I, I want you to think this through. We live in a country of immigrants. I think that's blatantly obvious. My family, at least my father's family, came to this country somewhere around the turn of the century. I forget the exact year, but not long after 1900, I believe. We have some of the paperwork that was signed. And Listen, they were immigrants. They were, uh, they were German-speaking people, but they had come from... Uh, what is now Ukraine or Russia, that general area, and they were immigrants, and they scrimped and saved and all of the rest. Many of you have come, your ancestors have come from countries like that, sometimes from Western Europe or Eastern Europe, or many of you from other countries in Asia or in Latin America or other places, and here's what often happens with immigrants when they come. 
That first generation has lived without. That's why they left their country. They know what it is to, to suffer and scrimp and save and really have a hard time. And they get here to the United States and boy, they work hard. Immigrants often are the hardest working citizens we have. And I mean, they are after it. But if they're not careful, they can get a skewed view of money. And sometimes that next generation that has not seen the suffering that the first generation went through in the home country doesn't understand the balance. And so parents, that's up to us to teach it to our children. Let's go to Luke 12, all right? Luke 12 and verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto him, Take heed, and, or unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now we're not going to read the following verses. I would encourage you to read from verse 22 all the way down to verse 40, but I'll reference those in our notes here. So we want to give because we want to be rich toward God. Letter A in your notes, there is a great threat to our financial life. All right, if I told you there was a great threat to your financial life and I asked you, what is it? Some of you would name a politician, all right? We're not going to do that. You'd be right, but we're not going to do that, all right? Others of you would say something, you know, without a face, but just as uh, a bad, and that is inflation or... Uh, we might say, uh, you know, greed on Wall Street or uh, mismanagement or whatever. A lot of different things we can mention. But, you know, that is not the real threat that the Lord Jesus gives to us. Roman numeral one, the threat is not fraud. That's what this man thought. And I can picture him in the crowd raising his hand and Jesus says, yes, you. And he says, Lord, I want you to talk to my brother our parents have died and we have an inheritance and he's not dividing it with me. He's taken all of it for himself or he's taken more than he should and would you straighten him out, please? And I love the fact that Jesus does not get involved in that. You know what he says? He tells us that the threat to our financial life is not fraud. The threat to our financial life is covetousness. That's the real enemy, friends. Can I say that the threat to your financial life is not a president? I know you disagree with me because you complain to your friends and your neighbors and you post it all over Facebook that it's a president or a senator or a Congress as a whole or a governor or you know some man, a shadowy figure in a smoke-filled room somewhere. But you're wrong. That's not your real enemy. Your real enemy is within and it's covetousness. That's the enemy that Jesus wants you to watch out for and wants me to watch out for. Luke 12 and verse 15, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. The truth of the matter is, if the economy falls apart, and aren't you in agreement with me that it has to really soon? It's got to. We cannot keep doing what we are doing as a nation and as Western culture as a whole. It's got to fall apart sometime. And if that means that you and I are in rags and we are just scraping food together to get by, but yet we have the Lord and we walk close with Him and we have a close relationship with Him and our faith is strengthened and we have sweet fellowship, Imagine what our worship services would be like if that were to happen tomorrow. You realize that if the economy were to crash tomorrow, 
we couldn't fit enough seats in here to provide seats for everybody. And not just our church, but just about every church. Suddenly, people would want to come to church again. And the pastor wouldn't have to beg and say, hey, make sure you're in your place. All of a sudden, we'd seek after God. And I tend to think that God would look down and he'd look down at Madison Baptist Church and all the other churches and see his people crying out to him and hungering after him and a big smile would come on God's face and said, that's what I've been looking for all along. And you and I might be in rags and we might be a little hungry and have some hunger pangs going on in our stomachs, but God would be pleased. And by the way, I think we would be too. Because I think the fellowship would be sweet. I think there would be joy and good fellowship. All of the little issues that we have with one another, you know what I'm talking about. That person in the congregation, that's a burr under your saddle. Oh yeah, I know you have them. You know all that burr would just go away. You wouldn't care anymore. I wouldn't care anymore. We'd love the Lord. See, the real threat is covetousness, not whether or not fraud happens. Letter B, under number two, how can I be rich toward God and guard against covetousness? It's in the verses that we did not read, and again, I would encourage you to look, look those over later, but you'll probably know the verses. Roman number one, take no thought for your life. That's the first part. How can you guard against covetousness? Take no thought for your life. Stop worrying so much about the future. And, and God is not against saving. We've talked about that. But stop focusing on it so much. Don't let it be so much of your thought life. And that means to some extent, by the way, in the political realm, stop worrying about it so much. And Christian radio, by the way, sometimes is the enemy of God's work in God's people. Because the shows that are on there that people will listen to are the ones that will tell you the sky is falling. Hey, they're right. It is. But God never wants you to focus on the sky falling. Take no thought for your life. Same thing, by the way, with YouTube and all the rest. Roman numeral two, consider God's provision for his creation. Consider the ravens. Consider the lilies. Are you not much better than they? Roman numeral three, seek the proper goal in life. Seek not for provisions, but rather for his kingdom. Remember that riches are not something to be sought after. 1 Timothy 6, 9, but they that will be rich, in other words, they desire it, that's their goal, they want it, that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and in many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Riches are not something to be sought after. If God gives them to you, wonderful. If you are a wise manager of the finances that he's put into your care and those finances grow, Praise God. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. But it's never something that we should just have as a great goal in life. Never forget that if God gives us riches, they are not for us to hoard. Always remember to view your riches through the lens of eternity. So when you, tomorrow, if you pull up on your uh, computer, if you pull up your IRA or your 401k or your bank account, and you see some money in there, look at that number through the lenses of eternity. And think of it this way. 1 Timothy 6, 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. I want to lay hold on eternal life. I don't want to just get in there and sneak in by the skin of my teeth, so to speak. Now, we're all going to get there based on our faith in Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross, period, end of story. But as far as having something waiting there for me, I want to lay hold on that. I want to get there and have a place prepared for me with rewards. I want there to be a place that it says, you know what? Mike Weiss spent his life preparing for this rather than me getting there and looking around and saying, well, I know the Bible said that there's a mansion prepared for me, so I know there's one here, but boy, there's a lot of cobwebs in the corner, and there's nothing prepared. It's here, but I never laid up anything in store. Now, I'm using a human illustration. Please forgive me. 
But I hope you understand what I mean. I want to lay hold on eternal life, and so should you. So we need to look at our riches that way. And then Roman numeral four, be ready for his coming. If we look at Luke 12 and those verses 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I send you that, they, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. By the way, that, is a, that has a broad application, not just to Christians. It has an application to anybody who has been given something by God. Even some lost people will be in that type of a situation. And it's a whole other message. But the primary application here to you and me is to us as Christians that we ought to be remembering that our Lord is on his way. Let's go to Roman num or number three, I'm sorry, in your notes. Give because you want to be rich toward the future. That leads us to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. We want to be rich toward the future. Matthew 6, verse 19 to 24. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. A very similar passage to what we read in Luke. But give because you want to be rich toward the future. Not just rich toward God, because he is worthy that you would give to him, but rich toward the future, that we're going to be in heaven someday. And think about how short our time is here. Our time here is brief. I was talking with Brother Bob yesterday and and boy, he's, he's really just kind of physically going through it right now in a lot of pain, and it's just difficult. And I imagine that that is harder than probably many of us can even imagine what he's going through. But I, one of the things that the Lord brought to me that I hope was an encouragement is I talked to him about the fact that, listen, what we have here is just a speck of time when compared to eternity. And it's just a moment. It's a brief moment. And we feel like it's long. Boy, it feels long, doesn't it? For some of you, it feels real long, and you're ready for it to be done. And we cry out with the Bible and say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. But listen, it's just a brief amount of time. Well, we need to remember that when it comes to money as well. It's just a brief amount of time. Lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Letter A under um, number three. It is important to remember that you only have two options for your riches. Only two. First of all, you can lay them up here on earth, but here they are subject to corruption and theft. Again, it's called inflation. And I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. It's eating our lunch. Now, we're fine. I mean, we're getting by. It's not a big deal. I'm not trying to make you feel, you know, poor pastor. But listen, it's, it's eating all of our lunch financially. Uh, groceries. My wife keeps asking for more grocery money. I'm like, listen, I gave it to you last month. Knock it off. No, I don't say that. I, 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 listen, I understand. It's harder for her now to use the money that we've had for a long time budgeted. Now she's really having to be tight. Why? Inflation. And things are getting expensive. And it's just the way it is. And, and all of that. And, and it might get worse and probably get, will get worth, worse. But listen. Here on earth, I need to remember that it's subject to corruption and theft. But I also want you to understand that God does not prohibit us from laying up for the future. Well, how can that be? It says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. Doesn't that contradict what I have in your notes here? Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, go to the ant thou slugger, consider her ways and be wise. Which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provided through meat in the summer and gather through food in the harvest, shouldn't we all just say, well, God said we're not supposed to lay up treasure here on earth, so I guess we shouldn't save anything. No, you have to take all Scripture together. Okay? That's a Bible principle. 
But what is God trying to tell us? He is cautioning us against having that as our focus. When you take all the scripture together, you realize it's wise to save for the future. God gave us that example. It's right to do. But don't let that be your focus. Why? Because moth and rust corrupt. Thieves break through and steal. You're going to have thieves take your money. That's going to happen. So don't let that be your focus. Roman numeral two, your other option is to lay up your treasures in heaven. And in heaven, there is no corruption or theft. There's no inflation there. No acts of Congress to change what happens with your money, right? They don't print anymore in heaven. So listen, that is a great place to put your money. Letter B, what God wants is your heart because he knows that your heart will follow your riches. That's verse 21, where it says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So one of the reasons you ought to give is to be rich toward the future because as you're giving to the Lord's work, now that might be in the offering plate here, that might be giving to faith promise. That might be when a missionary comes by, you know, giving them something, you know, realizing that they need some tires and giving them some money for that or whatever. It might be maybe there is a, a somebody in need, maybe a fellow church member or maybe even somebody who is lost and struggling and you don't know if the money's going to go to good or bad, but God laid it on your heart to give it, then give it. But as you give, what you are doing is you are uh, putting the direction of your heart toward heaven so that it will help you think more of heaven. As you give, your thinking will be more on heavenly things and godly things because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then letter C, and here's how we close now. So focus on your focus. You need to focus on your focus. That's verses 22 to 24. Your eye provides light for your body. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. In other words, if your eye is focused properly, focused on something that provides light, then your whole body is lit up because the only way for your body to have light is through the eye. What he's trying to get us to understand here is, yes, something that is absolutely true in the physical world, the light of the body is the eye. But then the other thing that he's trying to get us to understand is we've got to put our focus somewhere. Wherever your treasure is, your eye, your heart, your focus is going to be automatically on that thing. So put it on the right thing. Because if you will put it on that which is light, if you'll put it on the things of God, if you'll put it on heaven, then your whole body will be, will be full of light. In other words, this, if you will be a giver, a generous, bountiful giver toward the Lord work, Lord's work in all of those forms that that entails, then your body will be full of the right kind of focus. You will be a heavenly focused Christian. But what else does it say? The wrong focus will mean a darkened body. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? If you and I are stingy and our focus is on the things of this world, if the focus of our money is, I want to have more things, I want to have riches, I want to have what this world has and enjoy all the things that they enjoy. I can't give to this or to that. I can't give to God's work or to the needy. I can't give toward that thing that God has definitely touched my heart about. Why? Because if I do that, I won't have anything for me. Well, then you're focused on something that is dark. And if the one area you have, one opportunity you have to be focused on light is now focused on darkness, boy, how great is that darkness? What kind of a miserable life is that? And I think we've all been there from time to time, and we have met people like that from time to time. And that is a miserable life. And God doesn't want you and me to be that way. He wants us to be rich toward the future. He wants us to be rich toward Him. Why? Because He is worthy. And then also He wants us to be rich toward salvation. I hope and trust that this has been a blessing to you. 
And I want to encourage you as we finish up these financial series that you and I remember that God not only wants us to save and to budget and to stay out of debt and all of those different things, but God wants us to remember we are stewards of every penny and then God wants us to use that to give and be a blessing to others. Let's pray and then we will have a brief time of invitation. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time that we've had here this evening and the opportunity to remember that you give us riches so that we can be a blessing to others. Lord, would you help us as Madison Baptist Church to be a giving church? Lord, help me. Lord, you know the struggle that I personally have many times with opening my hand and giving to others. But Lord, I pray that you would help me to remember what your word says about it, that I would be changed by your word. And then Lord, I pray for these, your people, the same, that you would help all of us to be givers. Help us to trust you, not to take thought for the things of the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Help us to remember that you're in control. Now, Lord, would you bless this invitation time? Use it for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.